Hi everyone, I am Father J. Boy Gonzalez. I'm a Jesuit priest and the director of the Ignatian Spirituality and Formation Office of the Ateneo de Davao University. The prayer that we will use is called a preparatory prayer. It is taken from the spiritual exercises of St. Ignatius of Loyola. Jesuits usually use this prayer to begin classes, meetings, spiritual activities, and events. It says that whatever we do should begin and end through God. And that is exactly what we want and hope for in this activity. May I ask the Catholics to mark themselves with the sign of the cross, while the others might put themselves in their own proper disposition. And so, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, Amen. Dear Lord, we ask you to help orient all our actions by your holy inspirations. Carry them out by your gracious assistance, that every prayer and work of ours may always begin from you and through you be happily ended. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Enjoy this event. Kababayan, ang Pambansang Awit ng Pilipinas. Ayang magiging Diyos ang sigatanan Alam ng puso sa titik ko'y buhay Upang binigang Kuyang ka ng magiging Sa mandulupin Di ka pasisigil Sa nagatang tutok sa sigo'y
Good day world! Good morning Massachusetts! Magandang gabi Pilipinas! Maayong gabi Idabaw! Good evening everyone! Welcome to our theological conversation with the theme Moral Life, Virtues and the COVID-19 Pandemic. This is brought to you by the Theology Department of the Ateneo de Davao University in partnership with the Ignatian Spirituality and Formation Office. I am Ana Magno, your host moderator tonight. The program flow, the opening remarks, introduction of the speaker, input of our dear invited professor, then the conversation proper. We encourage you to write your questions, comments in our FB page and YouTube channel. We will gather your valuable questions and relay them to our speaker. The program will continue with a short message and the closing remarks. Please stay with us so that we will have a moral and virtual sleep later this night. We have already quite a number of registrants, so we owe them some acknowledgement. We will do it in groups according to the institutions they belong. Let us start with those outside the Ateneo de Davao University. Asian Theological Seminary, Assumption College, San Lorenzo Village, Makati City, Ateneo de Manila University, Ateneo de Sambuanga University, Banate National High School, Bank of the Philippine Islands, Brotherhood of Christian Businessmen and Professionals, Christ the King Paris, Surabaya, Indonesia, Christian Life Community of the Philippines, Colegio de San Juan de Latran, Colegio San Agustin, Daughters of Mary, Health of Christians, Davao Medical School Foundation Incorporated, Davao Oriental State University, Divine Word Seminary Tagaytay, and St. Alphonse Theological and Mission Institute, Everest International Academy, Holy Cross of Davao College, and Ignatian Institute of Religious Education Foundation Incorporated. Thank you for being here with us. The other institutions will be mentioned later in the program. To officially open this activity, let us hear the opening remarks of our dear Reverend Father Joel E. Tabora of the Society of Jesus, President of the Ateneo de Davao University. Thank you, Anna. In the name of the Ateneo de Davao University and particularly with the Department of Theology of its School of Arts and Sciences and the Ignatian Spirituality Formation Office. It is my privilege to welcome Father James F. Keenan of the Society of Jesus, the Vice President for Global Engagement of Boston College and the renowned moral theologian to this first Ateneo de Davao University theologic, theological conversation in collaboration with the Ignatian Spirituality Formation Office on the moral life, virtue, and the COVID pandemic. I also welcome all of our participants that are coming in through StreamYard, Facebook, and YouTube. Daily, our fear of the invisible enemy increases. We thought that with the vaccinations, we were near the end of it, but then the virus mutated. The exercise demon didn't even bother to be fully exercised, but has already come back with variant demons seven times worse. Meanwhile, there is frustration among our people in limitation of movement, in limitation of human interaction, in limitation in performance and achievement that seems to come with forced online education. Even as we now must stress self-discipline, agency and efficiency among our students. The frustrations lead to issues in coping, issues in mental health, even depression. How does one act in this situation? How ought one act in this situation? One option is 
close one eye, one's eyes and hope for the best. Anyway, key decisions do not belong to me. Decisions pertinent to the management of the disease in the Philippines relative to containment through public health policies, management of the hospitals and of the persons necessary to run the hospitals, isolation of the infected, contact tracing policies on quarantine, these decisions are not mine much less the production of and global distribution of the vaccines. The contemporary power of science and technology through international collaboration developed within one year several vaccines to conquer the pandemic, killing the global human family. But these vaccines are now being distributed according to the prerogatives and privileges of wealthy humanity. Europe is now near herd humanity and privileges of wealthy, it's now near uh, herd humanity through aggressive and systematic vaccinations. While the United States of America is, on the one hand, still trying to convince vaccine dissenters that taking the vaccine protects others, especially vulnerable children. While on the other hand, recognizing a third round of vaccines for full immunity, while the virus continues to decimate peoples in poorer nations. Today, the Philippines has the distinction of being the first in infections in Southeast Asia. We watch this with a certain amount of concern or shock or amusement or anger. But what can we do? So close one's eyes and hope for the best. Or open one's eyes and act in the hope that one can be of actual help. Use a mask, use a face shield, social distance, limit physical contact with human beings and resolve to get vaccinated. But while waiting for the vaccines to arrive, help in spreading good information in supporting voluntary activity that supports the frontliners and support vaccination programs. Join groups that reach out to those who have lost their jobs or their livelihood. Feed them, help them get back on their feet. Join circles of people that reach out to, per to, to people having difficulty coping show your concern and manifest your compassion. Life, the unexamined life we have heard is not worth living. We know that, but this COVID situation is so consumptive of life, there is not much left for examination as over and over again, we hear of new infections and over and over again, we hear of a friend lost, a relative lost, a loved one rushed to the intensive care unit, a loved one who doesn't make it. My personal response then, only a very humble, do good, avoid evil, or at least try. Or as a Christian, in faith, try to follow Christ in this confused world, Christ still carrying his cross, and try to see things new in Christ and say, 
upon receiving the news that the fight against the pandemic is not being won, but being lost, thy will be done. Take comfort somehow in the mystery of that will, the will that tries the just man, Job, by fire and affects holiness in his struggle, the will that sweats blood to embrace the Paschal mystery in acceptance of a father's redemptive compassion. With St. Paul, then, we boast in the glory that is beyond and boast also in our afflictions, for afflictions produce endurance <clears throat> and endurance proven character and proven character hope that does not disappoint. For we firmly believe the love of God is poured out onto us. Loved by God, we believe in our dignity. We believe in our redemption. But what should we do now? In this faith, in this hope, we continue to struggle with this pandemic. Even as we love God above all things and our neighbor as ourselves, we try to understand what serving the least, the lost, and the lowly in this life obligates us to for a life worthy of the kingdom of God. For whatever you have done or not done, for one of these, the least of my sisters and brothers, that you have done or not done for me. As this pandemic rages through this conversation, may we all grow in insight into how the virtuous Christian should act. Thank you, Father President. May I now call Ms. Marlena De Ritt, a theology faculty, to introduce our dear speaker. To our university president, Father Joel Tabora of the Society of Jesus, to the Jesuit community here in Davao City, the entire Philippines, and from other parts of the world currently online with us, to those holding offices in the higher administration of this university, fellow faculty, beloved students, staff, to other religious congregations, institutions, and faith communities who are with us via online, warm greetings to all of you. Before I further introduce our resource speaker, may I take this opportunity to acknowledge some more of these institutions, congregations, and faith communities who decided to be here with us. They are Institute Technology Sabah, Malaysia, King's University College in London, Local Government Unit of Cordon, Isabella, Loyola School of Theology, Molokolo National High School, Notre Dame of the Jangas University, Integrated Basic Education, Notre Dame of Marbell University, Our Lady of Perpetual Health, Help Seminary, Our Lady of the Pillar College, Kauaian Incorporated, P.A.R.E.F. Woodrow School, Philippine Women's University, Manila Taft, The Redemptorist Fathers, St. Paul University in Dumaguete, San Beda College, Alabang, San Jose Seminary, San Pedro College of Davao, Sanata Dharma University, SMA Colese, Loyola. To those that I have not mentioned and not mentioned so far by our main host, Mom Anna, we shall acknowledge you later in the program. So, how do I introduce our speaker in few minutes? 
when I get to see, just like some of you, a 66-page curriculum vitae. Indeed, it is a document that speaks of a person whose life works and appointments have touched so many lives for so many decades. Still, it is good to highlight something that we find in that document and on the website of his current school, the Boston College. Our world-renowned speaker took his undergraduate course in Fordham University. He had his Master in Divinity in Western Jesuit School of Theology and his licentiate and his doctorate in Systematic Theology at the Gregorian University in Rome. His research interests and the courses he teaches include, among others, fundamental moral theology, virtue ethics, history of theological ethics, ethics of Thomas Aquinas, and ethical issues on HIV and AIDS. The Boston College News says this about our resource speaker. In 2018, he was selected as recipient of the John Courtney Murray Award presented by the Catholic Theological Society of America, or CTSA, in recognition of a lifetime of distinguished theological achievement. The award is the highest honor bestowed by the CTSA, the principal association of Catholic theologians in North America, and the largest professional society of theologians in the world. In 2020, he became president-elect of the Society of Christian Ethics. He is currently the vice provost of global engagement of the Boston College Jesuit Institute. This is a key leadership position in Boston College's efforts to enlarge its international presence and impact. As can be read from his 66-page curriculum vitae, he is an accomplished scholar who authored or co-authored or edited or co-edited numerous books, articles, periodicals, among others. He is no stranger to the Philippines and to the hearts of Filipino and Asian students. For aside from be, being a visiting professor to the Gregorian University in Rome and that of Dharmaram Vidya Chetram in Bangalore, India, he is also a visiting professor of Ateneo de Manila. And now, in this graced occasion, he is with us through the invitation of the Ateneo de Davao University Theology Department, in particular by our chairperson, Dr. Rowe Kimba, a former student of our esteemed speaker, in partnership with the Ignatian Spirituality and Formation Office under the direction of Father Jessel Gerald, Gerard Gonzalez of the Society of Jesus. Friends, ladies and gentlemen, it is my honor and humble privilege to give this online floor to our speaker, moral theologian, ethicist, writer, theology department faculty of the Boston College, the canisius professor, James Keenan of the Society of Jesus. A virtual round of applause, please. Thank you. Um, so I'd like to um, make this presentation somewhat personal um, because my relationship, um, I have quite a number of relationships with different people in the Philippines and I'll mention them occasionally in my uh, presentation. Um, but I started uh, coming to uh, the Philippines when Archie and Tengon was made provincial. He had been the moral theology professor at Loyola School of Theology. And once he became provincial, they needed a moralist. And so I came and, and um, Jim Bretsky also, we alternated. I started coming every other year and I ended up having some really wonderful different um, uh, 
different uh, colleagues who uh, were just superb. Um, and I found a level of hospitality at, at, uh, uh, in the Philippines that I had never encountered anywhere else. Um, and so I'm going to say things about that, uh, about my relationship with the Philippines. I, I was there five times, and my last time was in 2008. I, I was working with Agnes Brazal, uh, a theologian, who um, she and I and Eric Hanilo, um, a Jesuit at the Ateneo, uh, the three of us were going to be hosting a small conference for 40 uh, Pacific Rim theologians, moral theologians uh, in Manila, and I had just been diagnosed with all probability of an advanced melanoma. <laughs> uh, I was told this two days before I was supposed to be in the Philippines, and I ended up um, deciding to still go to the Philippines, even though I was going to have radical surgery and I would have two to three years of treatment um, with a 50% chance of survival. Um, so my last time was on the eve of a lot of uh, cancer treatment, and I'm still here, so I'm happy with that. Uh, but so my relationship with, with the Philippines is really rather deep. And when Rowie uh, contacted me, um, I have a, a pretty busy schedule, and um, there was no way I would say no uh, to this invitation. Uh, so I just wanted to first remark how grateful I am for the invitation and how much I really um, look forward to this conversation. Um, so let me, um, you know, thank Marlena, uh, Anna, um, Paul, and, and uh, Roe for, for all this, and let's get underway. Um, one of the things that I'm really interested in is that... Um, in the moral life and COVID-19, I think of COVID-19 as I call it the great revealer. It reveals. It reveals the world we actually live in. Not the world we'd like to live in, not the world we think we live in, but the real world that we do live in. And I was really struck by Joel's presentation about inequity, because I think that that's what it reveals more than anything that I think we thought that the world was going along much better than it was. But as a matter of fact, it's not. And there's inequity everywhere. Inequity about access to vaccines is a prime example. In my country, it's a disgrace that we have these vaccine anti-vaxxers at a time that they're causing other people to get infected because they get infected by not being vaccinated when the vaccines are available to them. And, 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 and we have any number of people supporting them in this. And, and, and even when we have uh, hope, we have a variety of religious leaders around the world urging us in the name of the common good, in the name of neighbor love, that we be vaccinated so that we can protect one another. Um, so that when you come to a country like my own that has so many privileges and we don't take advantage of them when they're right here, it's shameful. And so we're living with a certain humiliation in the United States as we see how backward a country we really are. This is something that's being revealed to us. I think that what's being revealed is, as Joel said, of all around the world, inequity by the vaccines especially the distribution of vaccines, the access to vaccines. We may have a World Health Organization, but we don't have World Health. And we have to be able to see this revealer as giving us some challenges. In my own university, um, and, and this is something I would suggest probably is at Davao as well, we, it's also revealed gender inequity. We have found for instance, that our women faculty have had a greater difficulty in meeting the demands that are with them than our male faculty, for the most part. What did we find? We found that regardless of how we talked about care, 
being served by both genders, that as a matter of fact, care in the family still falls preeminently to women. So that in the care of children and in the care of vulnerable adults, uh, women and women professors in particular are shouldered with a double responsibility of doing their work at the university and also meeting family demands. And, 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 and what we're finding is, are the universities attending to this reality of the gender inequity that's there? I'm on, a, I'm on two committees, uh, one an international one and one here at my university, just on gender inequity. Uh, and I'm going to come back to this in a moment, because I think in the, in the Philippines, too, that when we talk about concepts like fortitude and resiliency, there's a certain added expectation on women to be resilient, to be fortitudinous, to, oh, you can do it, you can do it, you can do it. And as a matter of fact, there's something burdensome about that. And there's something that needs to be critiqued. So... What I propose to do is to talk about 12 virtues in uh, 17 minutes, which I have. Uh, and that may be able to give enough material so that the questions that we get uh, can engage these. These, 17, these 12 virtues are basically virtues that I developed over these past 30 years. But in light of the questions that Rowie sent me beforehand, he sent me about 19 questions that came from the audience as stimulus for this presentation. So the first virtue that emerges, it, it has to be justice. Justice has always been the premier virtue. It, among the cardinal virtues, you could say all the virtues are about justice. It's about giving to each their due. Give to each person what is expected of them. But a virtue works interiorly. A virtue works interiorly. Thomas Aquinas says, justice is in the will, meaning it's in your desires. Somebody who is just is not somebody who does justice, but somebody who loves justice, that it animates them. It's something internal and it expresses a desire for equity. This is what we need to do is to look around the world and see who are the people who are calling for a sharing of vaccines, for a sharing of masks, for greater equity around the world? Who are the people who are showing this love for that? So the premier virtue is justice. I would say that almost all virtue exists so that we can be just. The second virtue I want to say is fidelity. Many, you know, People will say, I know I have to take care of a lot of people, but I have a child, I have a parent, I have a spouse, I have a, I have a relative who's sick. Fidelity is not about um, simply taking care of equity. Fidelity is that we have special responsibilities, that we are obliged to cultivate and develop. We only have two parents, you know, um, when my mother was alive, I would call my mother. I'm the oldest child of five. I called her every day. I was the oldest child. I figured I had to call her. I called up no other person every day other than my mother. Why? Because she was my mother. That's fidelity. Fidelity is different from justice. Justice is about a mindfulness about equity. But fidelity is about particular relations that I have that I have to maintain. And during COVID, there's some, it's sometimes very hard to figure out what you should be doing. Because on the one hand, you have immediate family and needs of fidelity, but you have great social need happening all around you. So justice and fidelity. The third virtue, and this is a virtue that I think Filipinos have, with all due respect, difficulty with, self-care. I, I, I have directed more than enough students to know that if I say something about self-care, they think I'm a heretic. I think that the virtue of self-care is key. Love God and your neighbor as yourself. Now, how can you love another if you do not, how can you care for another if you can't care for yourself? And, and this will come back to this question of gender inequity that we have all the time. But I think it's very, very important 
for, um, for us to understand that there's a virtue of self-care. You know, so think of me. I'm told by my doctor that he thinks I have an advanced melanoma, that I have a 50% chance of surviving, that he needs to do a biopsy on me immediately. And I say, well, I can't because I have to go to the Philippines. Agnes Brazal is waiting for me to come to the Philippines for a meeting that I'm hosting with her and Richie and these things. And he says, when are you coming back? I say, I'm coming back in eight days. He said, then in nine days, I'm doing a biopsy on you. And in, and in five weeks, we're doing major surgery for four to five hours on you to see, to see if we can stop this. Now, I was on that plane saying to myself, what are you doing? But that was a decision I made. Sometimes with self-care, you actually do make bold decisions. Self-care doesn't mean that you're just saying, oh, I have a headache, so I'm not going to work toward restoring democracy, or I'm not going to work toward um, the, the needs that are here with me. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about a sense of do I really think of my needs and how issues of my health and well-being are sufficiently being addressed? And for me, my experience in the Philippines was whenever I would say self-care, it was like, get behind me, Satan. You know, just you should not be bringing that up. But I do think that in the Philippines, a message about self-care, especially for women, is really something that men should be doing. Um, so that's my third virtue. The fourth, and this is probably, if justice is the first, then this is the most important, prudence. Prudence is the virtue that tells you, you know, whether you should take care of yourself. Like, should I have stayed at home? Or should I have been faithful to Agnes and Richie and going to the conference? I had a conflict between whether I should take care of myself and get the surgery right away, or should I go to the Philippines where I had 40 people coming and we have been planning this for a long time and Agnes and Richie and I were working together on it. Or what about the issues of justice? But prudence helps me to decide what I need to do when these things conflict, when issues of justice, fidelity, and self-care conflict. There's a, there's a Jesuit, I've mentioned him now a few times, Eric Ritchie Hamilo. Um, I read his writings in the Philippines and he writes a great deal, um, a great deal. And what I find in him is an acute prudence. Sometimes people think prudence means caution. But real prudence means the capability of getting to the end. The capability of getting to the end. I always use a, a text called the letter from the Birmingham jail that Dr. Martin Luther King wrote to white ministers saying, why aren't you here supporting us in the civil rights movement? Because that was a call to prudence he was telling the white ministers, you are not adequately prudent. You are not adequately moving toward bringing about civil rights. So when we talk about prudence, prudence is not cautious. Prudence is about trying to get to where we need to be. If we think we have to have greater equity in this world, prudence is going to get us there. If we're going to be able to talk about new privileges and rights for people in the Philippines, Prudence is going to get us there. Prudence is the virtue, the intellectual virtue, practical wisdom that tries to get us to the right place. So we need prudential people. That's the fourth virtue. The fifth virtue is what I think is mercy. I define mercy as the willingness to enter into the chaos of another. This is a definition that a lot of people like and use quite a bit but the willingness to enter into the chaos of another. And I think that if we wanna talk about what makes justice Catholic, what makes fidelity Catholic, and what makes um, self-care Catholic or prudence Catholic, it's when it's merciful. Today's gospel reading is to be merciful as your heavenly father is merciful. 
Mercy is the willingness to enter into the chaos of another. So if we want to bring injustice in the world, we have to attend to where there are greater problems, greater difficulties, and it's not a great deal of clarity. So mercy, if you will, animates justice, fidelity, self-care, and prudence. The next virtue is fortitude. You need fortitude in order to do this. I had this superb doctoral student, Monica Halandoni Nalupta. I think she's, I think she's here at the uh, uh, one of the registrants. Monica Halandoni Nalupta. She did her dissertation on fortitude in the Philippines, and how fortitude became oppressive for many women when they were told to be resilient. You can do it. You can do it. You can do it. And no one is helping her to do it. It's just being, she's just being told, you can do it. Oh, we know, mama, you can do it. We know, honey, you can do it. We know, you know, we know, secretary, you can do it. We know, admin, you can do it. And, and there's a certain inequity that's happening there. And she, she wanted to say, when is a virtue a vice? When is a virtue a vice? And another, uh, another scholar, her name is Lisa Tessman, Lisa Tessman talks about burden virtues, burden virtues. When do we put virtues on other people that are too onerous? Right now, we look at our nurses and doctors. They are fortitudinous. How much are we supporting them in their work? Or are we simply saying, you have to do this, you have to do this, you have to do this. Are we mindful of their needs? Or at a university, when we see women unable to meet sub expectations because they still have so many care responsibilities, what do we do? And do we say, oh, you're resilient. You can do it. You can do it. Or do we become mindful of the fact that maybe we're imposing burdens on people? So sometimes when we're talking about virtues, we want to be attentive to whether there's prudence involved in this whether there's mercy involved in this, or whether we're actually giving people burdens. The next virtue I would say is honesty. We just came from four years of a government with Donald Trump. We, we started registering the number of lies that man told us on a daily basis. He was the president of the United States. It was so ignominious to have the White House to be the center of so much lying. I think that it gave permission to many other people to continue the lies, such that we have 30% of our country who believes that Donald Trump did not lose the election. How does that happen? Dishonesty breeds dishonesty. Honesty breeds honesty. And I think today, around the world where we have populist leaders that we need to be able to get the truth out. And honesty in our own lives helps generate truthfulness in our own countries. The next virtue would be solidarity. I think that when the Catholic social teaching began talking about um, the option for the poor, Pope John Paul II invoked right away solidarity. And I think solidarity is a new 20th, 21st century virtue. Solidarity means that I not only don't go it alone, I go with you. I join you in this. When, when you work together to change things, we enter into solidarity. Solidarity is a new mindfulness that in the work for justice, we need to do this collectively. And we need to make sure that we bring people to the table whose voices can be heard. And I don't think, I think sometimes we bring people to the table who are our friends. <laughs> like I run a couple of things. I always try to bring two or three people to the table who I really don't like, or, or, or I know that they have problems with me. Um, because if I don't bring them to the table, they're going to be outside the room talking, and I need them to be there, and I need to hear what they're saying. So I think real solidarity is not simply about friends. It's about other people who share 
you know, a common vision, but may have different routes to get to realize that common vision. So solidarity is not that I pick and choose the people I really like, but I work with the people who are going toward the same end of greater equity and greater fairness and greater respect for human dignity. Um, one of the, there's just two more to do, one, uh, three more to do. One is, uh, four more, pardon me, I've lost my count. Uh, the next one is humility. St. Augustine was asked, what is the first virtue? And he said, humility. And then they asked him, what is the second virtue? And he said, humility. And then they asked him, what is the third virtue? And he said, humility. I define humility as knowing my place in God's world. I think that the Magnificat is Mary's song of humility. The Lord has done great things for me. Holy is his name. The Magnificat is Mary's expression of where she is in God's universe. I think, for instance, I'm 68. So I'm 68 and with have gone through two cancers. <laughs> so, you know, like um, the, when the vaccines were rolling out, everybody was saying, oh, well, you'll be getting it soon. <laughs> you know, you'll be getting it soon. And, and that did happen. I was embarrassed by that. Um, because I felt I was being privileged. But the humility kind of means just let other people figure out where you are in this world. Sometimes we need to know where we are, but I think that real humility is learning from others where you are in God's world. So I think humility is not about being, um, you know, uh, that humility is that you put yourself down. Humility is simply being open to understanding your place in the world and, and, and understanding if you've been given gifts that you're asked to use them. Um, I think humility, we, we need to stop with false humility. Oh, oh, I don't deserve this, I don't deserve this. When inside the person's saying, oh, I'm so glad I'm getting this. There, there has to be in humility and honesty and an honesty about humility is like Mary's being able to say, the Lord has done great things for me. It's the ability to see that I am in this place and therefore I am called to do this or that. Um, two more, one is uh, playfulness. Um, I think the Philippines is, was the most fun I've ever been in. Um, whenever I used to go out with three people on a regular basis, whenever I would be teaching, uh, Karen Enriquez, a theologian, uh, would come with her car and pick me and Richie Hanilo and my dear friend Lucas Chan from Hong Kong, a Jesuit who since has died. The three of us would go out and wherever I went in the Philippines, we laughed and laughed and laughed. There is something in the Philippines of not only its resiliency and its fortitude, but its playfulness. And hopefully in COVID-19, the Philippines can, with their wild imaginations, convey that even in these struggles, as Joel said, even in these dark times, playfulness occurs. In, in, the, in the novel, The Plague by Albert Camus, they're, they're working, trying to push back the plague all the time. And there's this Dr. Ryu. And finally, they've been, they've been working and working and working, and so many people have died, and they're working and working and working. And suddenly, at one point, Ryu turns to a friend and says, let's go for a swim. There's something about that, that suspension of everything and going into playfulness. Playfulness has resolved tensions. Playfulness diminishes the um, drama it gives us a, a, a way of being restored. So there's something I think that's particular to the Philippines and I think it's playfulness. And I think that in, in, it, that does not mean to deny your situation. It means to constructively say, how can we continue to move ahead? And I think that playfulness is really rather key. Um, 
And the last, uh, and then I'll conclude on faith, hope, and charity, is hospitality. That hospitality, we know from the early church, the early church, that, that the early church was known for its hospitality. It practiced the works of mercy. It gave shelter to the homeless. It gave food to, there's a wonderful book by Rodney Stark called The Rise of Christianity. Um, Rodney Stark, The Rise of Christianity, in which he argues that the whole um, development of the church was first um, that there was the kerygma, that we were able to say in a brief way what was accomplished by the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus, and that we could be hospitable in our churches to all those who were arriving who, who needed support. And the works of mercy became the way that we did that. So hospitality, which is again, a strong Filipino virtue is really needed, I think, in a time of COVID. I find here, like I, I'm constantly running into students in terrible need um, or a terrible anxiety and they wanna talk and I'm like, I don't have time, but you, we have to do something and respond. And I think hospitality is not, you know, simply hosting a tea party. I think hospitality is the way that we welcome another. Finally, I just want to say faith, hope, and charity. These three go together very much. Um, and, and these are the virtues of grace. Um, uh, faith is how we believe in God. And, and out of that faith, God gives us two main virtues. First, God gives us faith, but then God gives us hope. And Thomas Aquinas says, we are given hope because life is arduous. He uses the word arduous every time he talks about hope, and he talks about hope a great deal. Hope is not given to us because life is easy. The givenness of hope is that it came to us when it, because life is arduous. I always think that hope was born on Golgotha, that as Mary and Mary and John stood at the cross and Jesus died, that's where Christian hope was born, in the face of real difficulty, real, the arduousness of, uh, of life. And the last is charity. Thomas Aquinas, whenever he uses the language of charity, he talks about union. He says, charity is union with God, charity is union with your neighbor, and charity is union with yourself. And, and this notion of union, I think is really important as we face COVID-19. That if we don't understand that the entire point of creation is to be in union with God and not to be fragmented, then we're not getting th these virtues that I've just espoused. All the virtues come down to expressions of charity. So I think I've gone over time by about four minutes, but now we have plenty of time for questions. Thank you, Father James Keenan, for your insightful sharing with a personal touch and with sensitivity to women. The many years of your reflection about virtue ethics and morality become very significant to us in this difficult time. When we are finding the balance between opposites, contradictions, and extreme situations confronting us in this time of the pandemic. Virtues are the best moderators, and we are glad to hear your frontline wisdom. Let us give Father James a short break while Ms. Uh, David will acknowledge the next group of our registrants. Thank you, Mom Anna. Uh, let me acknowledge some more institutions, congregations, and faith communities who are right now part of our online audience. So they are Southern Luzon State University, Spiritualitas Ignatian Community, St. Carolus Hospital, St. Agnes Academy Incorporated, St. Paul College of Pasig, St. Paul University in Surigao, St. Therese Parish, the Rizal Memorial Colleges Incorporated, Universitas Islam Bandung, University of San Carlos, University of Santo Tomas, University of the Immaculate Conception, University of San Jose Recoletos, 
Widya Mandala Surabaya Catholic University and Xavier School. Should we miss any institution, may I invite you to please put in the chat box your institution and who knows we will acknowledge you later. Thank you and we are appreciate your presence here. Back to you, Anne. Thank you, Ms. Marmar. Now we will now proceed to the conversation proper. We will be joined by uh, Dr. Rowie Kimba. Father Joel is here. Ma'am Marlina Derit. And later, Ms. Tehani Angas will be reading the questions from our live feed. To start, Father Joel, would you like to give a comment to the talk of Father James? Or may shoot the first question. Father Jim, thank you very much for your presentation. Uh, it was very personal and uh, uh, very, very uh, situated in the Philippines, as it were. Father, for, uh, for us who are trying to work with this uh, pandemic, uh, where, where should we, should we, where ought we place more of our attention? on caring for the other who is next to us or trying to do something to rectify the global injustice in the world. Well, well can you help us there a bit? Uh, so one, one thing that we always say about Catholics is it's not either or, but both and. So it's faith and works. It's not faith or works. It's not Catholics believe in both end. And, and so I don't think you can answer your question by excluding one. I think you need to say you do, you're called to do both. That somehow you need to attend to what's happening in your home or in your department or in your school or in your parish. But you also need to attend to the fact that if you don't go beyond that, then you're not working for change that needs to happen all around the world. Um, I mean, if I just paid attention to Boston College, I wouldn't be on this right now. I mean, I'm not on this to tell you what to do. I'm on this so that I can learn from you what you're doing. And, and I think that the more that we cooperate with one another, the more capable we are to respond to more global issues. Uh, but what I do feel is COVID-19 has showed us that we're in much worse situation than we thought we were. And I think that that knowledge should not be lost. Climate change is the other issue besides health that, that shows us where we are right now. What do you Thank think? You, what do you yeah. think? Love? Do, do you well, I, 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 uh, I, I agree with you. I, I, I really think that we should, except that it's a little bit discouraging because because from the Philippines alone, when you go to the global stage, you're not finding the allies in the church that you think we would have. Um, right. the, the allies in the church are worried about other problems. Right. The allies in the United States are worried about vaccine, right. vaccine deniers and, uh, and, and the problems you have with insurrection on, on your capital. And, and, and they're not worrying about our uh, uh, ending the pandemic globally. Uh, um, so how, how, do, how do we find the allies we need for the change that you're talking about? I would like to think that there are allies within the United States about these measures. Just because the media will focus in on those who are concerned solely about the anti-vaxxers or about Trump and the rest, I think most of us are really trying to figure out, as I said, we feel a certain humiliation that, of where we are right now. So I do think that there's much more out there than may meet the eye. However, I wanna say, I wanna use an analogy here. In my country, we still expect that when there are issues of race, that black people will speak up. That has to come to an end. When there's issues of racism, the whites have to speak up. As I said, when there's issues of gender inequity, men have to speak up. They expect women to talk about their 
difficulties, when men know the difficulties, but don't bother to acknowledge that. So Joel, I understand that, as a matter of fact, there's something tiresome about those, say, in the Philippines that have to raise the question about inequity when they're the victims of that inequity. But there is a certain way that we have to keep getting those who are elsewhere to acknowledge and to speak up before those who are the victims of these structures of inequity happen. So for myself, for instance, I just wrote an article two months ago, uh, pardon me, two years ago on race. And I found that in my own writings, I always let my, my African-American colleagues write about race. And I realized how racist that was. And so I wrote an article about coming to terms with my own predilections of saying, well, black people will take care of that race. And then all of a sudden we had Black Lives Matter. And that, that changed, that didn't change everybody in the United States, but I'm sure that 30% of the whites in the United States now think differently because they called us to it. So I do think that the Philippines has to keep insisting that there is a way for greater justice so that finally, just as what we saw here, people will finally understand that there needs to be a response. So uh, I do believe that it's unfair that the victim is the one who is crying for help and, and demanding justice. But I don't think that we move forward unless that happens. That what has to happen is conversion in the other parts of the world. And that conversion does not happen from within. It happens from without. I was converted not because I started thinking about race. I was converted when I saw how much rage was in our streets during COVID when black people risked their lives to say Black Lives Matter. So I, I don't think, I think you need both. Thank you very much, Jim. Thank you. And I can't hear you. And I can't hear you, you're muted. Thank you. Uh, Father, here's a question maybe related to what you are saying. Uh, what virtues are necessary that may guide policies, policy making? I think honesty. I think right now the biggest problem in the world is social trust. We don't trust our governments. There's, social trust is really, one is, you know, this question of equity, but also dishonesty. And, and with populist governments, we see more and more dishonesty. Now we don't have a populist government, but we still have dishonesty. So I think social justice, thing, it needs to be won. And if there are policies, they have to be transparent and they have to be accountable. This is the same I think we have with our bishops and their leadership, that we need them to be accountable and transparent. The social trust is not just with our governments, but with our churches. And we need to have greater honesty, and which ex expresses itself through transparency and accountability. Most of those are. And thank you, Father, for those answers. Are there more questions that probably, Sir Rowe, can you see some questions that are being yes. on our live? Are we? Yes, yes I, I have a question for Father G. Father Jim, um, there's a talk about uh, vaccine diplomacy and the the fact that this vaccine is being tied to or associated with diplomacy. I think something is really wrong with this. What is your thought on this? I don't. I don't understand what that means. I don't understand. What that means. Um, yeah, there are three confusing, uh, confusing views now on the idea of vaccine diplomacy. But is it the real, uh, in the political realm that uh, uh, it's it's being uh, reduced to uh, the competing camps between the U.S. and China, and they are the ones ascribed as the main players yeah. about. Oh, there, there is a, a there is, yeah. There's a the, well. This goes, I think, to the issue of honesty. I, I think that I I think that in 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 all these populist movements that we had, we tried to um, shorten issues of accountability 
We, we gave leaders the prerogative to do what they needed to do. And we allowed them to have more power and less accountability. And I think that this diplomacy issue is just one bully working against another bully. That there's a certain way I'm going to prove you wrong rather than that I'm going to be accountable. So I do think that this question of honesty in our governments and the way we proceed is really kind of crucial. Hey. Yeah, my, my, my thought also, Father Jim, is that when you speak about vaccine diplomacy, for me, it's, it's not really reflective of what we talk about uh, virtues. For me, when you talk about vaccine diplomacy, it's so tainted with power and politics. So I'm, I, can't, I can't hear you. Um, the, the vaccine diplomacy, Father, I think is very much associated with power and politics. I always get suspicious whenever that is mentioned. I've never heard of that. I've never heard this phrase, vaccine diplomacy. Yeah, so. it's, it's uh, at least, no, at least here in the Philippines, no, I, we always read that one in newspapers, in social media, and so on and so forth. So is it like that, that the U.S. is trying to cultivate a particular country um, to get the vaccine and China is trying to cultivate a particular country to get a vaccine? Is that what that vaccine diplomacy is? It's more like um, uh, giving vaccines to allies, not a particular country yeah, that's what like I mean. the U.S. Yeah. 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 Um, yeah. But so, so, so for me, Father, it's, it's, it's really devoid of the virtue that you've been referring earlier. It's it, because for me, it really tainted more with with power and you know politics and all of those things. Right, I, I, I concur. Uh, you know, I concur. However, I do think that um, that there's a certain way that allies do work together. That just as we're interested in justice, there's also fidelity. So, for instance, just to be blunt. If I, got a, if I got a call from a school that was not the Ateneo, I would not be doing this interview. I, I don't, I, these two weeks are the busiest two weeks of the year for me. And I'm here because you are at the Ateneo. Now, that is because I want to be faithful to my relationship with my people there. You know, the people that I've known, Monica and Eric and 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 Agnes and 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 you, you know, I did this at so I do think that alliances are important. I think that when alliances become ways of bribing people, that's the issue. That or subjugation and alliance to subjugate a people so that the United States can get more out of the Philippines or that China can get more out of Africa. That, that that that's that's the problem. But I do think that alliances are important, um, not for friction, but because of historical relatedness. Yeah, thank you so much, Father Jim. Uh, thank you, Father. Maybe there are questions from the live feed, so I will um, call on Tihani to please read those questions for Father Keenan. Good evening, everyone. I hope you're having a great time. I'm sure we've all gleaned important insights from Father Keenan. However, in order to keep the conversation going, if you have questions for our speaker, please do not hesitate to send them to us via the comments section on Facebook Live and YouTube Live. So for now, Father Keenan, we actually have a question from Facebook from YouTube, actually. And this is from Miss Christine Evangelio. She asks, can, er, can mercy also be compassion? Yes, so, I mean, mercy is compassion. Compassion means to suffer with, to suffer with, passio com, to suffer with. And, and you can only be merciful if you enter into another's suffering. Um, so mercy and compassion go hand in hand. Um, Sometimes people prefer the word mercy because of the gospel language. Sometimes people prefer the word compassion because it seems to evoke more of a fellow feeling um, than, than mercy. Mercy can sometimes look like you're, you're condescending, you're just helping out, you're, you're just trying to do an act of mercy, but that's not what the mercy means. When, when we're called 
as the gospel reading today says, be merciful as your heavenly father is to be merciful. It's to be, be as compassionate as our God is compassionate. If you go into a mosque, you go into any mosque, it will say, you know, um, Allah, the most merciful one. Mercy is what defines the Abrahamic traditions. Mercy, mercy. And, and we use different languages for it, but one is compassion. Thank, Thank you, you so much, Father. Um, you're right. I agree. It's very important to consider both of these values as they go hand in hand. Thank you to Ms. Christine for sending us your question. But now, Father, we also have a new question from our Facebook Live from Raven RM. They ask, Father, how are we to engage church and religious leaders who actually side with populist politicians? I think, I think we have to say to them, speak the truth. Speak the truth. You know, why are you doing this? In my country, many, many of our bishops during Trump's said nothing. Um, we had executions going on. We had children taken from their parents at the border. Uh, we had removal from the Paris Accords. We had so many different awful actions happening and our episcopacy was basically quiet. Then comes a Catholic president and now they have to form a task force about their relationship with him. Why didn't they have a task force for four years with that, that man? And, and so I think we need to speak the truth. I think that laity, I think priest, I think we need to be able to speak the truth to church leaders and to our national leaders, you know, in a way to say, you have to be accountable. Nobody should be above the law. You have to be transparent. The only way we understand truth is when there's transparency. Thank you so much, Father Keenan. That was a very important take. The truth is important in all contexts, in religion, in politics, transparency also. So thank you to Raven for sending in that question. Now we have a new question from our YouTube Live from Patrick Voldrick, and they ask, how can we promote the willingness to enter into the chaos of the other if most of us are busy with our own chaos? Yeah, uh, well, this is my both and answer to Father Tabora. It, you know, I'm not saying that you don't take care of the chaos that's around you, but you have to also be responsible for the chaos out there right now. I, you have to be responsive in some way. You know, I think of myself, you know, I'm told that I have an advanced cancer and what do I do? I get on a plane because I had a responsibility here in the Philippines to go there. I think most of us are that way. Most of us realize that we do have chaos that we have to respond to near us but we also are not, we don't put on blinders. We pay attention to what's near us. We think in Jesus, for instance, Jesus had to go away and pray, but eventually they found him and eventually he knew he had to respond to them. So there's a certain way that I think that we're all called to try to find a balance. And that's what prudence is about, trying to find a balance. Um, yeah. Again, another very striking answer. Actually, during your talk, Father, it was very striking to me when you said that it's not either or, it's both and. And if you have to attend to the fact that if you're not actively going beyond your immediate environment, you're not working enough to bring change. So thank you for that answer, Father Keenan. And thank you to Patrick for sending in your question. Now we have a new question from Danzen Mill and Doy, and they and ask. This has to be the last because I have to. I have to be out of here in ten minutes. I have, <laughs> I have to be somewhere with other people that I'm yeah. responsible to receive. So. Yes, Father. Thank you. Thank you so much, Father. So for our last question, we have from our YouTube Live, Dan Zen Mill and Doy. They ask, amidst the pandemic, how many people are becoming nihilistic in their worldview and belief that God has abandoned his creation? And how do we properly respond this philosophical and theological problem? I think that I think that that's a very, very, very important question. Um, I think that, you know, the Jews during the Holocaust would ask God, where are you? Jesus on the cross cries out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Mother Teresa talks about her experience that for years she would cry out to God and not get a response. 
I, I do think that we have to pay attention to the fact that there is that experience of wondering where God is on occasion. Sometimes it's personal, sometimes it's social. I think that the gospel shows us that. For instance, when you look at the pericope of the man born blind, the man born blind is healed by Jesus. Then he's, then he's put on trial at the temple. Where is Jesus? Jesus is left. Jesus has left the temple. During this time, the man born blind is going to be rejected by his parents. He's going to be cast out of the temple. He's going to be completely isolated. And then Jesus comes back to him. Throughout the, or, or think of the death of Lazarus. We know that Jesus is told ahead of time that your, your friend is dying. And what does it say? So he decided to stay a little bit longer. Why did he do that? Martha and Mary basically say to him, if you had come, my brother would be alive. There is in the gospel these stories that tell us that sometimes the absence, the felt absence of God is there. I don't think that means that God does not care. I don't think, I think it's that we have to acknowledge that though. We have to say that people do, like Mother Teresa, could not find an answer to her prayer. Almost all the saints will talk about an experience of a desert. And if we have an experience of a desert, that does not mean that God does not care, but that is our experience. And we have to, we have to be able to raise that up so that people feel that they're not becoming nihilist, but they're actually entering into a more profound understanding of their faith, a more profound understanding of their faith. When we ask the question, why me? We want to enter into prayer over that question. We don't want to walk away from prayer. We want to keep that question there in our prayer. So I think that if we're experiencing why us, why now, why this situation, we should not give people cheap answers. We should invite them to try to find what is the answer or where will God come in order to answer that question. So I think we're, we should encourage one another to pray to a God when we wonder, is God there or is God listening? Thank you, Father Jim. And as much as we would like to hear more from you, but because of time constraints, then we'll have to continue with the giving of the certificate by Father uh, J. Boy Gonzalez. Can we now present the certificate to Father Keenan? Hi, Father Keenan. Thank you very much. So this is the Atene de Dawa University School of Arts and Sciences, Humanities and Letters, the Theology Department, in partnership with the Ignatian Spirituality and Formation Office, presents this certificate of appreciation to Father Reverend Father James Keenan of the Society of Jesus for generously sharing his expertise and experience in moral theology and virtue ethics during the first ADU Theological Conversation with the theme, Moral Life Virtues COVID-19 Pandemic, given on this 9th of September 2021 in Atene de Davao University, Davao City, Philippines. Maraming salamat po, Father. Thank you. I, I'd like Thank to, you, Father Kinan. I'd like to say something about, it's lovely getting that certificate. I, I want to conclude by making a remark, telling you a little story that happened to me in 2008 when I decided to go to the Philippines. Because I had a, an experience of prayer that I never had again, but it stayed with me since then. I, I was invited by the Ateneo, the medical school, to address the medical school, which is all the way on the other side. From, I had to travel a great deal. And uh, well, you know what that traffic is like. And it's 2008, and I've been there for three days uh, doing these meetings. But now I've been invited to speak at this medical school. And there's about 400 people from the school there, and we're talking about medical ethics. But uh, what I don't know is how seriously ill I am. I do know that in all probability, I am seriously ill. And, and I'm saying to myself, and I would be sitting with Agnes Brazal and Eric Anillo every night saying, I don't think I'm that sick. And 
And then they say, no, you look good. And I'd be going to myself interiorly. I'm probably very sick, which is what I was. So we're driving, I'm in a cab, driving back to Manila, uh, to the Ateneo. And I'm at Katipunan. And right outside the campus, Katipunan intersects where there's about eight lanes of traffic. And it's the biggest traffic area that I've ever seen. And I saw that many, many times, Kati Poonan. And I was sitting in the cab thinking to myself, do you have an advanced cancer? Um, what, what's your situation? And all of a sudden, I saw these children who were begging, knocking on my window. And then I saw these women who were trying to get their children across Kati Poonan, afraid that one of them would run in front of a car. And you could see how overworked and tired and anxious these women were. And then I would see these men hitting flies with their t-shirts because they were common laborers walking. There had to be about four or 500 people out there. And I'm asking myself, do I have advanced cancer? And suddenly I saw the human condition. And, and at that point, I realized I was just a human being. And, and that gave me a consolation I never have had since. There was something about understanding what it means to just be a human being when you see the struggles of others, that suddenly everything puts into perspective and you, and you get a sense that I'm just a human being and a new humility comes into your life in which I think you become less afraid of speaking the truth, but also a lot less interested in, um, in being worried about yourself, being able to um, see the world as it really is. But that experience on Kari Punan was the most profound religious experience I've had in my life. And I thought I'd share it with you um, publicly for the first time. So thank you. Thank you, Thank you Father, for, the, for reminding us of our humanity. Now, uh, we would, may I now ask or rather give you, Sir Rowe Imba, the, the chair of the theology department for the closing remarks. Thank you, Anna. Happy Ateneo di Davao University Theology Days. It's our theology days from September 8 to 10. Tonight's success is a testimony of generosity of persons. Being his former student, I have known Father Jim Keenan in our class as a premier moral theologian, a true magister in his field. But as a student, what captivated me more in his person is his brilliance, clarity, and simplicity in teaching. In class, we, his students, listen to his many stories of persons and their moral life, their triumphs and their failures and their pursuit to a life of virtue, and their struggle towards freedom from vice. Learning from him, former students of Father Jim would impeccably conclude that moral life is about the cultivation of virtues rather than the mere avoidance of sin, that moral life is more about doing good for the other rather than be absorbed shunning evil. Then and now, Father Jim has been consistent in his lesson and witness, as we just witnessed earlier. Thank you, Father Jim, for sharing your life and expertise with us tonight. When we are gathered online, the church is here because the Lord is in our midst, and you become an instrument who filled our mind and heart with a joyful pursuit of a life of virtue, especially at this time of depressing pandemic. I would like also to thank our university president, Father Joel Tabora, and his visionary leadership that has empowered the theater department to soar new heights in participating in the joyful work of evangelization. Father J. Way Gonzalez, Mr. G. Leo Hisoro, and Ms. Gliza Del Mondo of ISCO, our partner in tonight's agrotheological conversation, thank you for the hard work, guidance, and patience working with us. To the host, Ms. Annalisa Magno, Ms. Marlena Derrick, and Ms. Eldriana Tihani Angas, you did a wonderful job tonight. To Father Charlie Sinzon and Mr. Romulo Vinci Berza, thank you for your assistance in disseminating information about this illogical conversation. 
to the ever supportive Davao Jesuit community, our great leaders and pastors, thank you as always. To my dear family in the Theo department, thank you also for your constant support. And to all of you, our dear 1,390 registered participants, individuals and institutions, students and professionals, lay persons, religious and ordained from here and abroad, your presence has truly made this night a night of communion in our shared desire to listen, to be moved by the Spirit, to express solidarity mm. and compassion to one another in our shared fatigue, anxiety, suffering, and even the loss of a loved one because of this COVID-19 pandemic. May this Abu theological conversation through Father James Keenan as our resource speaker warm our hearts with renewed enthusiasm see joy and optimism in our missional witness, inspire our personal and collective will for a life of virtue, affirm our capacity for goodness and kindness towards one another, and ultimately bring our night to a close with a firm assurance of our God who silently listens to our existential whispers and prayers and heals by his immense generosity of mercy and love. Stay safe, everyone. Good night. Thank you very much. So with that, we come our we come to an, the, the end of our activity. We thank you all for spending the time with us. May God bless your day, Father, in Massachusetts, and keep our night in the Philippines safe and peaceful. Bye, everyone. Always stay safe and healthy. Thank you very much. Thank you, Rowie.